you don't have to do negative things to to get attention and to make money in this world. You can have a good work ethic and learn a skill and man, that will take you as far as you want to go. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. There will still be the journey. The journey. New Sheriff in town, and his name is the journey. Journey. This thing is bigger than Nino Brown. This is the journey. The journey. What is it that moved you? The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey initiative is being generously supported by TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. Welcome to another episode of The Journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson, and today we have another amazing Memphis icon. But before we get to our Memphis icon, I want to give you a quote that I think is pretty powerful. It goes a little something like this. Defining myself as opposed to being defined by others is one of the most difficult challenges I face. And I think that says a lot because of who it comes from. It comes from uh, former U.S. Senator Carol Mosley Braun. And what that really means, guys, is that, you know, that being defined by others is always going to happen. But you got to break through at times. You got to keep on your path. You can't let that deter you. What someone else says doesn't really matter. So today I got an individual who literally, I'm sure, was told, you're crazy for what you're doing. We have a chef and an ice sculptor. Have you ever met an ice sculptor? I have it. So today we have Brother Stephen Leake, straight out of Hernando, Mississippi, award-winning chef, executive chef, ice sculptor, son, husband, father, all of that. Welcome. Chef Lee. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming on the journey. It's a pleasure being here with you. Fantastic. So this first eight minutes, we're going to go real quickly and we're just going to go through uh, just some rapid fire cliff notes. Sure. It says community. You were raised in, in Hernando. Tell us about that community for you as a child growing up. Oh, wow. So, you know, that's uh, d- deep south. Pretty much. <laughs> uh, I was born in 64. So okay. being raised, you know, in that area in that community uh racial tensions were always really uh and you know just from the history that we have in the united states we know how uh, how those type of of areas play out okay Uh, we're gonna we're gonna dig into it a little bit more because i want you to talk about that so who had the biggest impact in your life as a young person outside of your parents um i would have to say um my mentor, one of my mentors, uh, when I started uh, State Technical Institute uh, okay. back okay. in 1981, uh, Mr. Jesse Clements. Okay. So Jesse was probably one of the first uh, African American chefs that right. I had ever met, and um, what he did for me was he gave me the confidence and and the courage to to reach for my dreams. Really. And okay. and, and he actually. Um, Put me in place so that I could uh, I could have a good foothold. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was I always dreamed I was going to be this doctor basketball player. Mm-hmm. What dreams did you have of your adulthood as a child, and how different are you from those dreams? Uh, probably pretty different. Uh, <laughs> you know, because when, when I think about back to high school. Uh-huh. Uh, and this was back during the late 70s, you know, early 80s. And right. so, you know, computers hadn't really hit the scene yet. Uh-huh. Uh, but all of our counselors were telling us that, mm-hmm. you know, computer computers are going to be the way of the world. Mm-hmm. And so uh, when I graduated high school, I was like, OK, I'm going to be a computer programmer. Okay. And I enrolled in the program at uh, at State Technical Institute Okay, and uh, quickly found out that I didn't really particularly care for that. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm totally different from that uh, now. Well, I think you you bring up a good point. Sometimes you go down a road and it's not really for you. And it's right. okay to kind of course correct or adjust and try something new. Correct. So um, when did you know you were going to be okay, Stephen? You know, I, I, you had been at this for a while. Uh, but at what point in your life did you say, I got this? You know, Larry, uh, I, I look back on that and I think about that often. And, you know, the one thing that I can say, you know, we hear this in church a lot, you know, uh-huh. God will guide your steps. Right. And that's actually 
how my whole journey has really taken place. Really? Uh, because, you know, it was always uh, very difficult uh, and, or you didn't see African-American chefs out front mm -hmm. uh, in the older days. Right. Uh, and so Chef Larry Price, uh, who is the uh, sh uh, chef for Penny Hardaway now. Right. For, for Coach Hardaway. Yeah. And then uh, Ruben Criswell. Okay. Uh, Jesse Clemens. So mm -hmm. those were some of the first uh, African American chefs, and so mm -hmm. I was proud to to I even identify with that, right? Uh, and have those guys as role models for me when I was coming up. Did you do you ever is is there a big difference between a personal chef and an executive chef, or are those terms kind of interchangeable? Well, I mean, you know, the personal chef. I mean, you're pretty much just working strictly for that individual and his family, or in or, or the folks that are in his uh, in his company, right? Uh, Skill set wise, it's the same. Okay. You know, okay. so whether you're cooking for two people or 500, it's the same principles. Okay. Uh, you just probably, in his case, in that particular case, you're cooking for a smaller amount, but all of the skill sets and tangibles are the same. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I got a couple words I want, I want you to tell me or how they hit you and what bring comes to mind, so to speak. Legacy. What does that mean to you? Uh, doing. Good work. Okay. Um, always being of service. Okay. Okay. Um, Family. Commitment. Loving. Okay. Uh, strength, support. Okay. Yeah. Sacrifice. Always. always. Um, we always have to sacrifice something for our own benefit and for others. Okay. So. Okay. Steve, what's your why? Why you get up every day and, and, and fight that good fight? You know, uh, I actually love what I do. Okay. Uh, and uh, in this industry, even though it's really tough, uh, very demanding, mm -hmm. uh, lots of long hours, and a lot of times you're away from your family, mm -hmm. uh, I love the art of cooking. Mm -hmm. um, but more so than that, I actually love teaching and helping other people achieve their goals. Okay. Um, you know, a good example is many years ago, I used to go into the uh, penal farm mm -hmm. uh, and then I would do some classes right. with some of the lower security inmates. Mm -hmm. And I, I've just been honored to have uh, been in contact with some of those guys mm -hmm. years after they have gotten out and uh, and I would see them and they're doing well. And, and those guys would tell me, they said, man, what you taught us and what you told me, uh, help put me on the right track. Okay. And so that's, you know, that's, you can't ask for more than that. Wow. Okay. Okay. So can you remember the first chef job, the first meal opportunity you had to, to prepare for someone? Uh, so my first executive chef job, mm -hmm. um, I was 25. Okay. Uh, which is pretty young. Okay. And so um, I uh, was actually hired by uh, a company called Aramark okay. at the University of Memphis. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was my first executive chef's job. Um, you remember what you cooked? Well, so I was I was working in two uh, particular areas. I was working over at the cafeteria and uh -huh. then I also worked at the Fogelman and Executive Center. OK, I was doing both. Uh, but it was probably we, we used to do a lot of buffets back okay. then. So okay. it was always some uh, meat protein, okay. whether it was, you know, beef okay. or pork so or just something like that. Tradition. And then, you know, some type of fish and seafood. We always right. tried to do a balanced, healthy, but tasty well, meal. See, I used to be at the University of Memphis getting my MBA in the executive program. Mm. And I remembered you from there. Oh, wow, yeah. And cooking. Yeah. And man, I used to love those lunches <laughs> you used to put together. <laughs> wow, yeah. I'm glad to find out. Because I put it, I was like, I know that guy. Yeah. So, so okay, Here, here's the last question of this segment. And I asked brothers this, and I know it's going to be an interesting one because you're from Mississippi. Mm -hmm. From Mississippi. When was the first time you realized you was a black man? When you knew it was a difference between you and others? Uh, well, hold on. Hold on. I keep that thought. Hold okay. that thought. Listen, we're going to be right back on the journey. And Brother Lee going to tell us when he realized in the sip he was a brother. So stay right there. We'll be right back after this, The Journey.
Have you ever met an ice sculptor? Well, today you have, and you will, even more so in the second segment here with uh, Brother Stephen Leak. Stephen, before we left, you were saying that you were beginning to talk about when you realized you was a black man. When, can you can you unpack that for us, and, and, and what was the instance that you kind of said, bing, I, I get it. Well, you know, uh, I, I knew that at a very early age. Okay. Uh, again, being raised in, in the South. Right. Uh, but... When I was um, enrolled in in elementary school, uh, so the area where I lived in closer to Hernando, right, uh, we would have gone to Hernando High School, which was, right. had more African American students, right, uh, and so we were still they were still doing the. Um, desegregation of the school. So right. they bust a lot of the students that would have gone to Hernando to Horn Lake and right. South Haven. And I just remember um, the year that the third grade, my third grade year, mm -hmm. uh, they bust us again from Horn Lake to South Haven. It was a school called Hope Sullivan right. Elementary. And I just remember us pulling up on the buses and there were state troopers uh, standing out, kind of, you know, uh, guiding us in. And then I saw all of these, all these white parents uh, standing out in the yard, you know, in their pajamas and just very upset that uh, African-American kids were coming to the school. Wow. And, uh, and that just has stuck with me all of my life. What, now, how did you feel? How did you process that as a young boy? Well, you know, it's tough because you don't understand why. Right. You know, why are you so angry that, you know, a, you know, third grade kids are coming to go to school with right. your kids. And and then, you know, once we got inside the school, most of the kids at that time, all of the African-American kids were put in one class to, or classes together. And so what happened by my fourth grade year, okay. we had some African-American uh, teachers okay. and they were telling uh, our administration that we have some very intelligent kids too right that could be in some of the advanced classes right and so uh they went to their administration and then they took <laughs> some of us out of the predominantly african-american classes and then they integrated us into those more advanced classes with right. white students and so i remember being the only black male in my class and then there was one black female in my class out right. of 32 kids wow so it was uh, it was always very very Interesting and challenging I going bet. to school every day. I bet. So let's go back. Let's rewind the clock. We're going back to Hernando early on, mm -hmm. second, third grade. What was the family like? Did you have you, you were the you're the tenth of, the 10th 11, of 11, kids. eleven kids? Yeah. yeah. So so tell us about so the that baby boy. dynamic. Yeah, <laughs> baby boy. Uh, but you know, being raised on a farm uh -huh. uh, or in rural Mississippi, uh, families are very tight knit. Right. And, and the communities are as well. Right. Uh, I just remember, you know, in, in most of the families in my area or on my in my on my street had large families. Right. Uh, and so my best friend from high school, you know, Claude Williams, uh, his his folks had, you know, 10 or 11 kids. And and some of my older siblings went to school with them. Right. So it, it was always tight knit. Um, but my family dynamic, you know, we would have, you know, Sunday suppers right. every Sunday. And so all of the, the kids would come down. And then, you know, by the time their kids, my nieces and nephews right. and and uh, my older brothers and sisters, um, you know, they all worked, lived and worked in Memphis. Right. So my mom would uh, keep their their kids right. during the week, okay, so that they wouldn't have to worry about you know so childcare and stuff like your, that. With your nieces and nephews, oh yeah, we they were raised up with us, right? And so you know, my job was, and, and my baby sister Phyllis, she's right under me. Uh -huh. um, you know, we would actually take care of and babysit the kids. And so when my mom left the house, mm -hmm. you know, particularly like on a Saturday, uh -huh. uh, she would be like, "Okay, I need the house to be clean by the time I get back, and make sure you you, know, you feed all the kids." Right. So we would start cleaning the house from the front living room all the way back to the kitchen. Uh -huh. And so, you know, we just got a really good uh, uh, understanding of how to clean a household, right. how to cook and, and how to do all of those things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, discipline, the, you know, your nieces and nephews if you had to. What's the biggest age? What's the age difference between your oldest sibling and yourself? Uh, I'm 58. 
eight uh -huh. and my oldest brother I, is 75, I believe. Oh, so so he about, was grown pretty oh, much yeah. when, you were, yeah. when you were born. Yeah. You yeah. could have been his. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and my father passed when I was around 10 years old. So okay. uh, my, all of my older brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. you know, they kind of they were parents as well, as well mm -hmm. as my mom. So, yeah. OK. OK. Tell us a fine memory of, of, of back during those times in Hernando. Um, you know, so we didn't have a car. OK. Uh, growing up. So when we had to go to the. Go to Hernando, you know, I guess you could call that the city if you uh -huh. want to or town. Let's <laughs> go that way. Uh, so my auntie and my, and my uncle, uh, they had a truck. So uh -huh. we would ride all the kids. We we'd get in the back, back of the pickup truck. truck. My yeah. mom would get in there with my auntie and then they'd go to. Isn't it you know, funny how nobody got hurt? During oh, man. Time. Everybody no. was in the pickup no. truck. No car seats. No, no nothing. nothing. <laughs> you know, uh, and so we would love and that. to sit on the hump. <laughs> and even in the summertime when it's blazing hot, right. we're still in the in back, back of the, of the truck, truck, you know, yeah. having a great time. And so uh, those are really fond memories. Just going to the grocery store and, you know, if my mom had to go to the hardware store and stuff mm -hmm. like that, we just it was just oh, fun. That was cool. That's yeah. cool. Any worse memory, any memory that sticks out like, man, I could have done without that experience. Um, I probably had some experiences when I were in school. Uh -huh. um, I had some some encounters uh, with with some with some students uh -huh. uh, of the lighter persuasion and. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so I, I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I learned to be pretty good with my hands. Uh, <laughs> I, I just remember, you know, I think I was in the fourth grade again and we were we were all playing together at uh -huh. one point. And these guys were they were a little bit older. They were sixth graders. Right. And so the bell rang for us to go to class and they kind of isolated me back down the hill because the school was up on the hill and the mm -hmm. playground was under the hill. Mm -hmm. And so they isolated me down there and it was about 10 of them. And uh, so they were just kind of pushing me around and uh, one of them came out of the crowd and tackled me and I was on the ground and, you know, the rest of them were standing around what, thinking he was going to beat me up. But I learned to fight like a cat on my back. <laughs> right? You know, so uh, <laughs> it, it worked well, out. And, but, but my cousin and his friend came later to the rescue. So, right. you know, you know, I, I say I could live without that, but that was a good learning experience as well. So. All right. All right. In your teen years, let's fast forward a little bit to your teen years going to high school. Yeah. Where'd you go to high school? And South, South Haven High School. South Haven, um, okay. And, you know, there was some growth, some things that the, our school society grew. Mm hmm uh, you know, there was always still racial tension, though, all, mm -hmm. all the time. It just seemed, you know, it seemed like there would be times where it would it would get better. Right. And then something would happen. And then, you know, OK, we got the black against white. And all Did y'all have that? That I remember when I first moved to Memphis back in 96, there was some schools in northern Mississippi that had separate proms for the black kids and a separate prom for the white kids. Yeah. Was that? We didn't have separate proms, but we did have like a black king or queen right. or, and, and a white king or queen or whatever. So, and even I was in, I was on student council. Mm -hmm. And so we had, uh, I think my first position was like a, a minority representative on the student council. Wow. So, uh, and so, but what was interesting about that a couple of years later, I, um, I ran for treasurer. Mm -hmm. uh, at the, I think it was the eighth grade. And I actually run against one of my white count, uh, counterparts uh, mm -hmm. and I actually won. OK, so um, and so that kind of showed me that, you know, anything's possible because, you know, there was definitely more white people at school than there were African-Americans. So uh, but a lot of the white people voted for me. So, right. you know, All right. I guess I was kind of like leadership. Barack Obama yeah, I was in high say, school. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Modern day Barack Obama <laughs> <laughs> had it from crossing the aisle. <laughs> Adulthood. What's your, what was that transition like? You know, in college, did you go, you go to school? Yeah, I graduated from State Technical Institute. You, okay. Uh, and, uh, and then what degree did you have from? Associate of Applied Science with in uh, hotel restaurant management. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, how did that work into you becoming a chef? I'm trying to find that point where you said, you know what? Yeah. Just cooking food. Yeah. So Perfect. the gentleman I told you about earlier, Jesse Clemens. Okay. You know, uh, so the position that I hold now, he was in that position then. Okay. And so Jesse was from um, uh, Louisiana. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, he always, you know, claimed, you know, he was a, a Cajun Creole or whatever. <laughs> and so anyway, um, he, I, I was still enrolled in the computer operations program. Right. And so, but he would always see me come down to the building where he would have class. Right. And so one day he, he told me, he said, I'm going to, 
I'm going to give you a ticket to go to an event at the Peabody. And he said, I'd love for you to go. And uh, and I said, OK, I had never been to the Peabody, didn't even know about the Peabody. Okay. And so I went to I went to the event and um, and when I, I went there, he was hosting some big event there and mm-hmm. he was there in the chef whites. And so when I walk in, I see him. I see this tall African-American brother with, you know, the this, this chef whites on. He's got that toque, the hat. And I see him and he knows everybody that's who's who in Memphis. And I see him interacting with all these folks, uh, very diverse crowd. Right. And, and then I see the food that he's displaying and then uh, he's you know socializing with all these folks. And I was like, man, that's what I want to do. And so when I went back to school Monday, I went to go see him to thank him. And he said, he said, so what do you think about being a chef? And I said, man, that's what I want to do. And uh, so. He was, so he said, OK, go change your major. So I went and changed my major and enrolled in his program. And I, I really haven't looked back since. That's amazing. What has Memphis meant to you professionally coming out of Hernando? You know, Memphis has been good, though. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I've been in this business for so long now. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I now I'm one of the old schools. So you're the, now, you're the yeah. Jesse Clements. Yeah, so I'm the OG. You're talking and, to everybody. <laughs> right, know right, everybody. right, right. Okay. And uh, but Memphis has been good, man. Um, when I was working at the the Omni Hotel, I, I was looking at how much money we were charging people to come in and for an event. And I was like, man, I said, I can cater and do some of this stuff. I'm doing it anyway. Right. And so that's when I first had the brainstorm that I was going to start a catering business. And so my wife and I were uh, very newly married. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think we had a young son at the time living in an apartment. Okay. Not far from uh, from Southwest now. OK. And uh, so I started catering out of my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cooking roast and, and oh, you wow. frying chicken, you know, uh-huh. for an hour or two, you uh-huh. know. So uh, that, that was the first time when I really decided I was going to start my own business and it's just snowball from there, man. That's and that's why I say God's really like measured my steps uh, right. because every every step was put in place for me to step even further and higher. And it's just been it's been a wonderful experience. I want to know how a brother become an ice sculptor. I want to know that. How did you how, what happened to say, you know what, I am going to chop up this ice yeah. And, and and display all these different cool features because yeah. I never heard art in your background. Right. No. And, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not artistic. I probably am a little bit better now okay. than I used to be. But uh, so when I was working at the Crown Plaza, um, I was I was a line cook and um, I was walking in the back hallway close to the back dock and I hear a chainsaw. Okay. running. And so I was like, you know, being from Mississippi now, right. I'm used to cutting down it. trees right. and busting up wood and things like that. And so I see, I, I step out the back door and I see a, one of the chefs back there, cigarette hanging off of his mouth, gas chainsaw, and he's got this big block of ice. So I'm, I said, man, what are you getting ready to do? And he said, uh, I'm getting ready to carve, carve, an, make a nice carving. And so he, 30 minutes later, man, he had created this beautiful swan I seemed like just out of the air. And I was like, I got to learn. How to do that. <laughs> and so when I when I left the Crown Plaza, I started working at the Omni Hotel uh-huh. and one of my chefs was an ice carver and I started training with him. OK. Back then. Yeah. How long did it take you before you got pretty good, good enough to say, I'm going to sell this to somebody? Okay, so it took a while. <laughs> uh, my, my chef that I first started training with, his name was uh, Mark Peters okay. Peterson, and um, so Mark was like five eight uh, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, cussed like a sailor. Oh, uh-huh. and so anyway, so I, he was so talented with ice carving. I asked him, I said, "Man, can you can you teach me?" He said, "Yeah." So he told me, he said, "Look, I just need you to make sure we set the." ice carving station up and he said watch me he said then you you know you can start carving so i watched him for a while and then when he said okay you you watched enough it's time you put your hands on the saw right and so he chose a a flower basket okay and i asked him i said why do you why'd you choose this one for me to start with first he said it's you know simple enough that you can grasp the concept of it he said but it's challenging enough because it has a lot of rounded cuts right and so uh, I, i did my first flower basket it looked like crap. <laughs> he saved it and put it in the freezer. So on Sunday brunch, he puts the flower basket out on display. And I'm sitting back like, man, please, no. And so <laughs> all the guests are coming in for Sunday brunch. Mm-hmm. And um, 
you know, and all my friends was telling me my ice carvings are horrible. Uh-huh. Uh, but I did a basket for like two months in a row. So each week they progressively got better and better. And wow. so, and then he later told me, he said, I did that too, because I was training you because I didn't want to have to cut the ice anymore. So, <laughs> you know, so it worked out. It worked out. A chainsaw. Yeah. So that's your, that's your, I guess your, your paintbrush in a sense is a chainsaw. Well, you know, it's chainsaws, uh, several different types of chisels. And, and honestly, the ice carving world has evolved majorly since I first started. When I first started, we would use a chainsaw and we probably had maybe three chisels. Okay. Now there's a whole host of different types of chisels. We use sanders, die grinders, um, heat guns, mm-hmm. torches. Okay. So, and, and, and now over just in the last, I want to say 10, 15 years, uh, they've created CNC machines. Mm-hmm. So yes, now we can take right. images, put them in our software program, and it can do like the silhouette of a lot of the work. So it takes a lot of that workload off of your shoulders gotcha. and back and things like that. Gotcha. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Any regrets as, re- far as it relates to your career or life for that matter? I don't have any. Good. Yeah. Good. I don't okay. have any regrets. Okay. If you could talk to your younger self, that kid that was about, was in that busing line, if you could talk to them. What would you tell them? Uh, stay the course. Stay the you course. Know, stay, stay the course. Stay strong. Uh, believe in yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, life can be good for you and it will be good for you uh, if you believe in yourself. You know, and if you have a good work ethic uh, and, and you care about people like you care about yourself, good things will happen. Fantastic. Well, this is the last one. This is the last question, Steve, but it's not really a question. It's a request. There's young men and boys that are listening and watching this. And I want you to talk directly to them in that camera and tell them, give them a Steveism or a leakism that they can carry with them from this conversation. You know, I'm going to give you a chef leakism. And and that is I'm, I'm going to go back to believing in yourself. Uh, and have a good understanding that you don't have to do negative things to to get attention and to make money in this world. You can have a good work ethic and learn a skill. And man, that will take you as far as you want to go. Believe in yourself. Believe in your family. Get away from all of the negative stuff and focus on the positive, which is you. Wow. Like I told you, we have another Memphis, a great Memphis icon, Chef Stephen Lee. Thank you. Thank you for sharing thank your you. journey. Thank you, Larry. It's great. On the journey. And listen, we're going to keep bringing them. We're going to bring them every single week. So you stay right there because this is what it's about. It's about bringing you in front of individuals who can show you that you might fall down. You might bump your head. You might have all kinds of trials and tribulation. But if you continue on the positive cat road, you're going to be a success. I'm Larry Robinson for Brother Stephen Lee. This has been The Journey. Thank you for your time. See you next time. Thank you to our partners, the Delta Boule and Tennessee Valley Authority. To hear more incredible stories like this, be sure to download the Kazookian app from the App Store or Google Play. Or check out The Journey Memphis podcast on all your major podcast providers. Also, check us out on the Kazookian Network.